welcome to another addictive episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast with your host and sailing addict, David Howes. Hi folks and welcome to episode 44 of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. In this episode, I'm going to share some of my thoughts on club racing, on solo sailing and on Hamilton Island Race Week, our second uh, time up there this year and the difference to last year and the lessons we learned. So enjoy this episode uh, with myself, David Howes. Hey folks and welcome back to the Ocean Sailing Podcast. It's great to be back in the saddle producing fresh content. Uh, like last year I had a break for a couple of months with my own sailing, with the things I've had uh, going on and uh, I really wanted to reflect on some of the thoughts and lessons from this year in this episode to really share those with you, uh, particularly if you're a cruising racing type of sailor or a bit of a racing sailor or looking to put together a team for a specific regatta. So uh, I really want to share those thoughts and uh, and uh, in, certainly in the episodes ahead, we've got some really interesting content coming up, so look out for that over the, over the coming weeks. So in terms of uh, just in terms of sharing some thoughts on racing, we've just finished another really good season at the Southport Yacht Club in the Gold Coast in Queensland, Australia. And I race a 26-year-old Beneteau 44.5 racer cruiser type yacht. And over the last uh, four seasons, we've progressively built up our crew skill and, and experience and we've progressively improved our boat speed and upgraded from Dacron to carbon sails and, and, and just got a whole lot better at what, what we've done in terms of basics. So I just really want to share some thoughts with you around some of the things we've learned and some of the things that I think are important um, that are often overlooked when it comes to successfully competing at a club level. And one of the things that you know I love about sailing is you know, whether you're cruising or racing, you know, sailing is all about living in the moment, and and particularly with racing, it's it's about living in in that moment, in that minute, and and, and literally trimming your boat to get the best out of it in, in that tiny piece of time. And as much as you can think ahead to the next leg or or the next weather change or the next hoist or drop, you know, racing is all 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 of a series of moments made up of of those small pieces of time in which you optimize your boat and and put all those tiny moments together and, and to create an overall race result. And, you know, we've we've had four years of racing now at South, the Southport Yacht Club. We've done more than 300 races uh, at the club and then up and down the east coast of Australia with races like the Sydney to Gold Coast race, Coffs to Southport race, Hamilton Island race week a couple of times, and, and some races up on, on Morden Bay. And we've had we had a really, really good level of success given given the age of our boat um, and, and what it was designed for. And you know, when I think about some of the results we've we've achieved, many of the the, the series wins we've had, uh, where there's been you know ten to fifteen races in a series, have really only been by one or two points, which which equate essentially to one or two places in just one of those twelve to fifteen races within that series. And and in many cases. You know, we just finished five or five to ten seconds ahead of the next boat a couple of times, and that's the difference at the end of the series. Those one or two places from just one or two races, and that's the series decider. And and when you look at boats and crews that consistently finish, you know, second or third or fourth, and and those that are able to win, you know, more often than not, then then those little differences make make all of the difference. And I think I think part of that psychology as well. It's it's easy to go twilight racing or, or club offshore racing and and have a lot of fun, um, but, it, but equally as easy just by being a little bit more focused. It's amazing what you can achieve achieve in terms of results. And you know, I guess by way of example, in March this year we snapped our boom, an alloy boom in half. Uh, we were at the start of an offshore race, uh, eighty four miles in length, uh, twenty knots, and uh, we cranked the main sheet on a little bit tight. And the 26-year-old boom decided it was going to, going to uh, help us no more, and it snapped clean in half, uh, and was flailing around and gouging chunks out of the cabin top. Uh, and luckily, it didn't hit any of the crew. The challenge for us was we were we had to withdraw from the race before it started, and it took five weeks to organise a replacement for our boom, which which meant that we we were ruled out of 
you know, contention for the offshore passage race series of the club. And then in the Twilight series, which is a fording race series uh, that we have every Thursday afternoon, we drop from 5th to 10th quite quickly uh, in that series before w- working our way back up to 7th by the end of the series. And and that came about because for five weeks we raced with no boom. Uh, we decided that unlike most other boats that would just withdraw from club racing, we decided that it would be a good training exercise to race with no boom, put up the appropriate Genaro or jib, and then put our storm trysail up as our mainsail, uh, and we decided what you know why sit at home when we can still go racing, and you know when we decided to do that, clearly a forty-five foot yacht racing with essentially a a Genoa and, and not much of a main doesn't go very fast, and so our goal as a team was you know let's just not come last, and we have a pursuit style system for our twilight racing where the slower boats start first and the faster boats start last and theoretically you're all finished together um, on handicap and so for us our goal was not to come last and so we started racing and uh, fortunately uh, in all of the the four or five races we did with no mainsail um, we didn't come last in any of the races and uh, what we did find was uh, storm trysails are are not designed to sail upwind at 30, 30 to 35 degrees so we developed a bit of a workaround system uh, where at the b- at best we could manage about 45 degrees uh, and then we had a, a double sheeting system that became you know, a four-person job to, to, to tack the trysail going upwind. But, but we kind of got it working and, and it, was quite, it was quite cool. And uh, in, in one of our races in particular, you know, it's blowing 20 knots. Uh, we had a number three jib up. We had the trysail up. We were going up upwind and in one case we passed a Bavaria Match 42 uh, that's rated... Uh, 6% faster than us on IRC and that was going up wind with a Genoa and a main it was overpowered and rounding up and we sailed up 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 through the fleet and up up past it um, going up wind with our jib and trysail and uh, it was a it's just a good example to share because you know it's it's about this attitude of never giving up and never stopping racing if it's a po- if it's possible to repair your boat or to improvise and continue and because we managed to claw our way back to seventh eventually by the end of the series, once we got the uh, boom repaired, uh, it meant that because we won the first uh, Twilight Series of the season and we managed to win the last Twilight Series of the season, that that of a total of 42 Twilight races for the year, we came out overall as the Twilight champion for the year and uh, and by a couple of points, that was all. Uh, and if we'd sat at home for those four weeks and not gone out racing and, you know, delivering on our 10th and 11th and 15th places for those three or four weeks, um, then then we would have kissed goodbye to that opportunity. So it really was a, a great exercise in, in finding a positive in a bad situation and just really showing that, you know, even sailing without a mainsail, if you've got a determined team who are determined to sail to their potential uh, and, and they turn that into a weekly challenge, i.e. let's just, let's not aim for first, let's, let's just not come last, then... It is amazing where if you chip away week after week, one place at a time within each race, what you can achieve as an end result. So, you know, when I think about our last season and, and you know, all we've really done compared to the other competitors we've raced and and in these series we're talking about, you know, 10 to 15 boats in our offshore series, uh, 20 to 25 boats in our twilight series. All we've really done is stay just a slightly more focused for each of those individual one minute moments and, and you know when you think about three series of 14 races times 90 minutes then then that's really just you know 63 hours of racing or 3780 individual minutes of boat trimming and optimization that we just did a slightly better job of um, for those those minutes of racing that that than the boat that came second and, and we race on the PHS handicap system and I think it's called PHRS in some other locations and so handicaps are just between each race for two-thirds of the fleet so the first third get bumped back a bit time-wise um, the back third get bumped forward a bit in terms of starting times and so in this kind of racing there's no there's no permanent advantage and there's no permanent disadvantage and it's it's almost a socialist system in the sense that it, it works uh, and everyone has a chance to win if they sail consistently uh, and uh, and everyone has their day um, eventually based on what their handicap adjusts to and you know we've we've sailed poorly at times we've had poor tacks we've gone to the wrong side of the course we've had our bad days and we sail in a location where there's a lot of current so two to three and a half knots at times 
when maybe we've only got boat speeds of you know two to five knots in, in light wind conditions so the current plays a big part and you know no matter how bad our day is going no matter how bad our race is going um, we just focus on trimming for the conditions and getting past the boat that's just in front of us and then the next and then the next and it's just really a bunch of mini races within the race within a fleet of 10 to 20 boats and kind of that's how we approach it and we learn a lesson uh, the season before this one where we we needed to, we were in second place for the series uh, we were we had three races to compete on the on the final final day offshore and we we got too focused on beating another boat in the final three races to be able to win the series and we went out in our first race and we had a terrible start and we had a terrible upwind and we really just did everything poorly and and, and you know we did we debriefed in between races and they were it was round the cans you know windward lured racing we sat down as crew and said gee we better sort this out because now we've got two races left and, and now we're probably in third place not second place and um we just decided that you know let's just focus on sailing one leg at a time and not think about the race not think ahead just focus on getting a good start getting a good upwind good hoist good downwind good drop and just sailing one leg at a time one maneuver at a time uh, and it just changes your whole horizon when you think like that because you start executing in the moment and focusing on what matters not thinking about the overall picture or all the things you can't control and often we've found if we just focus on the boat we've got to beat and just back ourselves to sail just a little bit better than they do then the result becomes a result at the end of the day and you get a great result and you know that's been a big lesson and time and time again I've seen boats have a bad start or an early setback and instead of they working their way back into the race by sailing well, they take the attitude of we've got to do something different to the fleet if we're going to have a miracle comeback and, and it seldom happens and all they do is compound their problems further and while it's possible to outsmart the fleet, it's a rare achievement and you know, winning series or winning regattas is it's just really about playing percentage football as they say in the in the game of rugby union and you don't the great thing about yacht racing is you don't have to win every race in fact you don't have to you can even win a regatta when by winning no races at all uh, and so the great thing about yacht racing is if you're patient and diligent and you're just consistent and you just sail to your potential often you'll win regattas because you just don't have a, a series of bad races uh, that, that you can't drop as opposed to having a series of outstanding races to achieve a great result and We've won a previous series before that include you know 13 or 14 or 15 races. We've won an entire series of the club and never won in any one of those individual races just because we we have lots of seconds and thirds and fourths uh, and not lots of 11ths and 12ths and 15ths, um, which then becomes you know a drop reliant type exercise. So you know yacht racing is really it's simply a mathematical equation, uh, particularly when you're PHS racing. Um, and for example, we know in our Twilight series that if we can just average fourth, um, that, that essentially you can win the series. And in the last series, 14 races, we can drop three, we keep 11. So so 11 times fourth as an average means 44 points. And ironically, if we finish on 44 points at an average of four per race that we kept, um, and we finished three points ahead of the second race boat. And so here's the thing, right? If you know you just need to average fourth, and you wanted to be competitive and, and finish well in a series, then then whether you get second or sixth or seventh, you're happy because you know that they're all keepers because they're all sitting around that average of fourth place. And often I see boats that are sailing along, along in fifth or sixth or seventh place, and they decide to do something crazy and take on the boat ahead of them and pass to windward and get pushed up and out of the breeze and into a tussle, and three or four other boats sail past below the two of them while they're having their tussle and now that boat that was sitting in seventh on a result they could have kept quite happily um, is now 11th uh, and so you know a big part of it is just staying out of trouble and um, and then and then and then those races become keepers and then if you happen to hit double digits then you know that's one of your three drops and you can just take it on the chin and, and start fresh next week so you know it's um, it's, it's fascinating uh, the strategies uh, and the simplicity of what it takes to win um, PHS racing. And I did a bit of one-class racing on, on Flying 15s and Etchells uh, a few years back before I got into keelboat racing. Uh, and, you know, one-class racing is a, a, a great teacher uh, because 
you almost never lead from start to finish. It's it's always about you know getting a, a clean enough start, uh, your best start possible, but often about working your way through the fleet and sailing smart and letting those in front of you make the mistakes. And and too many boats who 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 are leading races focus on those behind them and stop sailing their own boat well. And, you know, a loss of conf- concentration, a, a lack of forward thinking causes unforced errors and, and leaves the gate open. And quite often we've been successful um, sailing from behind and working way, our way up through a fleet and, and just being patient and just being patient. And, and often it's quite amazing the mistakes that those that are leading make um, because they get complacent or they lose focus or where they do some silly things. So, you know, those things are, are lessons I've learned. So in terms of, you know, I guess a summary of my lessons that I've learned from from four seasons of, of club racing and my, my Beneteau 445, which is a 26-year-old racer cruiser, um, trim, 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 trim. Always be trimming. Uh, it's, you know, if you just find an extra 0.1 of a knot, that, that's 0.1 of a nautical mile or about 200 meters further ahead each hour that you race, and in close racing, you know, 200 meters can be a gain of one or even five places. Um, and, and in a series where you might win by one or two or three points, that's it. It's that point one of a knot for that one race that can make the difference between first and third or fourth or fifth in a series. And you know, be patient. You you never lose or win a regatta with one race or one bad tack or one navigational error. Just be patient and. and Get back on the horse and focus on what you can do next. Study the weather, study current, study tides. They are full of opportunities. And if you develop your knowledge of these and, and how they impact the race course, they will help you immensely. And, and when I started racing at Southport, when we race inside the, the broad water, the, the currents and, and tides are, signi- are a significant factor. The, the lands is a significant, significant factor um, in terms of where the breeze fades and where the breeze is strong. And the more you understand that, the more you can position yourself to often sail further, but sail faster in terms of speed over ground. And with offshore racing as well, and in our case, uh, we have a north to south current that's predominant, particularly in summer. Um, and again, if you study and understand the impact of those things and test and measure, then it's amazing how you can often beat boats that are 5 to 10% faster in boat speed just by sailing either a shorter or a faster course. So, so think about those things. Okay. So enough on uh, club racing. So the next um, the next sort of uh, thoughts I wanted to share were around solo sailing, and um, I haven't done much solo sailing at all. In fact, I've done I've done one solo sailing trip actually that you call a trip, and that came about in August when I was taking my boat Ocean Gem uh, north to Hamilton Island for Hamilton Island Race Week and. As we were leading up to race week and as we were leading up to departure, I had crew confirmed for the return delivery trip from Hamilton Island back to the Gold Coast, which is about 580 nautical miles in a straight line, but ends up being sort of more like 680 with a bit of bit of wind direction and a bit of upwind. And so as it got closer to departure and I realized that I had nobody for the delivery trip, I kind of decided that maybe I'll just do it solo. Um I've entered the solo Tasman race in 2018, which starts in April in about six months' time. And I kind of figured, if I don't do some solo sailing now, well, there's not much point entering a solo race without any without any training and without, without even figuring out whether I like it. And so, and so I decided that the opportunity to sail from Southport to Hamilton Island was a, was a great one to really test my like or, or dislike of solo sailing. So I, I left on... I left at midday on the Saturday after sailing out that morning, August the 12th, and seeing Andy Lamont arrive home from his uh, circumnavigation uh, westward bound around the world. And uh, so I started out uh, with the strategy of using radar uh, along with AIS and, and been able to set depth alarms on my chart plotter. So I set a 10 meter depth alarm uh, and uh, been able to set radius alarms uh, and also be able to set wind wind change um, wind, wind change alarms as well. So my, my plan was that on the first night I would test the concept of sleeping for 20 minutes and, and then waking for five and, and doing a bit of a check. And sailing up the east coast of Australia, there's it, quite a lot going on. There's a lot of land to watch out for. Uh, there's fishing boats. 
and there's ships um, and then and, and there's a you know a bit of recreational stuff around as well so I uh, I, I sailed the first night um, up past Morden the top of Morden Bay and up past Mooloola Bar and there was a lot going on and uh, it all went pretty successfully uh, in terms of the wake for wake for wake for five and sleep for twenty but I really felt like crap the next morning it was just terrible I I probably started doing the you know the twenty minute sleep from about ten p.m. onwards uh, and then waking for five minutes um, and, and I just didn't feel great the next morning uh, but you know it, it was adequate to get through the night. Uh, and regularly check for traffic that's not on AIS, that's 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 on radar, um, and, and it worked okay. So when I left Southport at midday on the Saturday, I, I had 21 hours to cover 180 nautical miles to get to Wide Bay Bar at the bottom of Fraser Island. So Fraser Island is the largest sand island in the world, uh, and the sandbar that you cross uh, at the southern end of it to go up inside Fraser Island uh, as you travel north. Um, the sandbar is about three nautical miles long and it's not very wide and it's shallow on both sides. So you kind of have to hit it, uh, you know, plus or minus two hours um, either side of high tide. And ideally you want to hit it um, while the tide's still going in. Uh, and so I think high tide was midday. My goal was to hit it by 9.30 in the morning. Um, so I got to the bar with about 45 minutes to spare. Uh, which was kind of nice. It was, it was, there was, we were down to two or three knots of breeze. Um, I'd had a bit of a rough night, um, but then I was able to, as I dropped my sails due to having not enough wind uh, and it be from being from a northerly direction, I was able to drop the sails. I was motoring along, and, and when I found myself 45 minutes ahead of schedule, I literally just turned the motor off, drifted, had a shower standing on off the stern of the of the boat or on the duck board, um, and, and watched as you know a couple of dolphins and a couple of whales kind of swam past and and then lined myself up for the bottom of Fraser Island. So I crossed the bar right on nine thirty and experienced uh, as you do uh, nine knots over ground, even though I was motoring at six and a half as the incoming tide pushed me in around the back of uh, Fraser Island and, and up through the channel. So I then spent the rest of that day motoring up the inside of Fraser Island to the bottom of Harvey Bay. Um, the, the daytime temperature was about 27 degrees Celsius. And, and so by the time I got to the bottom of Harvey Bay uh, at about 5 p.m., I'd been sailing for about 27 hours straight uh, and I was starting to fade. And I kind of figured that you know carrying on across, uh, across Harvey Bay into more fishing traffic probably wasn't prudent. So I found a nice place to anchor uh, in about 10 meters of water uh, at 6 p.m. and stopped and slept for five hours. I awoke at 11 p.m. and I felt great, 100% better uh, than, than I had before I'd gone to sleep. And uh, and then set out and sailed from that 11 p.m. through to 5 p.m. the next night uh, non-stop before making another stop at a place called The Pancake. Uh, further north of there. So part of the challenge uh, that changed my desire to sail non-stop uh, to Hamilton Island was my radar stopped working. And I had it fixed a number of times and it was kind of annoying because it was only three years old, um, but it, it stopped working. And so I couldn't really continue uh, sleeping for 20 minutes at a time uh, with the amount of shipping and, and recreational traffic. And of course, as you get up to the bottom of... Uh, the Great Barrier Reef, you start hitting a lot of islands and, and a lot of areas where you can run yourself into rocks. So I kind of figured that my strategy for the remaining sort of 350 to 400 miles would have to be uh, taking a short break for a sleep where I could anchor somewhere uh, and then carry on and sail for as long as I could. So I stopped at 5 p.m. and my goal was to sleep for five hours. So I did that. Um, and... As I was coming into where I needed to go in behind a, a reasonably large rock um, into the anchorage called the Pancake, the wind was you know 15 to 20 knots, and I had to point my bow into a short chop uh, to drop the sails. As I wasn't really confident that once I got inside the anchorage, which wasn't that big, um, that with the tide running out of there at two to three knots, um, that I'd have enough wriggle room to be able to point into the wind, drop the sails, and, and not end up with any any uh, running aground issues. Um, so dropped my sails, uh, and it was probably only 20 minutes off going dark. I motored in through the narrow channel with rocks on the southern side and a sandbank on the northern side and found a nice spot about two miles in behind the headland and dropped the anchor right on dark. And 
given I was planning on departing at 11 p.m. that night, I um, I noticed there were a number of really narrow spots on the way in in terms of the channel, and they were quite shallow as well. So I figured that all I could do was retrace my GPS, GPS track and when I departed 11 p.m. that night um, to find my way back out in the dark without without the risk of running aground. There was another boat traveling to Hamilton Island as well, a boat called Katie Gill that had left um, about five days before me. And um, I'd called up uh, the skipper, David, on the sat phone earlier. Um, they were about 100 nautical miles um, north of me, uh, and they were heading to a place called the Percy's, which is a group of islands. They said they were going to head there the next morning, uh, and I was about 180 nautical miles away from the Percy's. So I said, well, I'll meet you there, um, and I just figured I'd leave earlier and try, try and sail faster and, uh, and try and cover the 180 miles in the same time they were going to cover 100 miles. Um, with, uh, with with leaving a bit earlier. So set my alarm, woke up again at about 11 p.m., feeling pretty good after having five hours sleep. Uh, pulled on all of my wet weather gear and my safety gear. And at night I was wearing sort of four to five layers as the temperatures were anywhere between sort of seven and 11 degrees Celsius. Um, but as I headed north, the, the, they improved every night. And by my reckoning, uh, it was going to take me 28 to 30 hours to cover the 180 miles uh, as I was going upwind and often against current and tide. So that was my plan. Um, and I had, in the time going north, I either had no wind or I had headwinds. Um, so it, it was um, going to be a bit of a challenging trip. So I was feeling pretty good. Uh, and and I figured that, you know, it was doable to do the 28 to 38, 30 hours, sorry, straight. Um, but I'd see how I went from a tiredness point of view. And this is really part of testing what your body can cope with if you kind of put yourself in the ideal conditions from a from a nutrition and from a sleep and from a, a hydration point of view. And I was really keen to test how, how far can you push your body day after day after day, what, what kind of sleep can you live on um, and, and what starts to happen to your, your judgment and your ability to, to sail well as you get tired. And, and with the Tasman race in mind, uh, it's about 1,300 nautical miles, and it's about nine days. And so, you know, it's one thing to be cruising across an ocean. It's another thing to be racing across an ocean um, and racing solo. And really, I'm really keen to discover what, what, what's the best combination going to be, um, given that in some conditions you may have the same sail settings for hours on end. Other conditions you might have to um, constantly trim and adjust your sails or your heading um, based, on, based on what the weather's doing. So... I was feeling pretty good, uh, and, and what I found with the solo sailing experience was I, I found I had to be really proactive and, and not procrastinate when it came to actioning tasks, and, and so I quite easily got into the, the the mentality of if I'm thinking about doing it, I just need to do it, and the concept of not letting problems accumulate into bigger problems, where often if you're racing or cruising with a crew or a family, you can easily put off doing something for five or ten or 30 minutes just because you know it might be a premature decision you might decide to reef and then figure out maybe you don't need to reef you don't want to get people to do work unnecessarily um, but I found with solo sailing that that it was really easy to be proactive because you, you kind of figure quite quickly that that if you delay stuff you might get yourself into trouble uh, and so you know one of the things I found interesting was drinking a lot of water 24 7 um, to the tune of about probably six or seven liters a day um, kept me really, really alert. And it's easy to drink water during the day when you're hot and thirsty. Uh, and often as the sun goes down, we drink less water during the night. But, but you know, in actual fact, when you think about your body and, and, and the outside temperature and, and being active, uh, if you drink water around the clock, it's quite amazing how when you stay hydrated, how, how alert you stay. And so, you know, my, I had this, I fell into this kind of methodology of drinking water regularly, always having a bottle in the cockpit, um, making sure that if I was cold, that I quickly went and put more clothing on. If I was warm, I stripped clothing off. Um, I, I'd often have a coffee at 9 o'clock in the morning as a bit of a ritual. Uh, and then again, no, no more coffee until 3 or 4 a.m., which I found that that, that slot, once you've been up um, either most of the day or you've been up from you know late the night before through to the early hours in the morning was a, the slot where you can get drowsy. And and kind of by doing that and combining that with lots of hydration meant that the coffee worked really well. Whereas I think if you just live on coffee, um, then it stops being effective because it's a it's a depressant and a, and a dehydrator as well. 
the other thing I found is after a couple of nights was uh, I had speakers in my cockpit that I could Bluetooth my iPhone through, and so I started playing music and playing it quite loud. Uh, and it's quite amazing how if you do that at night, it, it really keeps you alert and gives you something different to focus on rather than staring into the darkness and, and, and into the quiet and, and often making it easier to be drowsy. So I think that um, I actually found night settings really, really easy uh, to stay alert and stay awake because you don't have the sun beating down on you, um, dehydrating you and, and, and making you tired. And so you know, I'd recommend if you're solo sailing, um, spending more time sleeping during the day and, and more time sailing at night because it's actually it's easier to get more sailing out of 24 hours than being out all day in the sun um, and and then trying to and then trying to sort of sleep at night. So, heading north, my day was full of whales and dolphins and and turtles uh, um, on, on a constant basis. And at one point, when I was up inside the Great Barrier Reef, um, I think it was maybe day two uh, or day three, uh, I sailed you know ten or twelve hours straight on on gorgeous blue water. Um, and with no other boats, no other ships, nothing in sight, just me, just the blue ocean and, and whales and dolphins on a regular basis. And it's pretty special. It's pretty special when you can sail in those kind of conditions and, and you, you've got the whole world to yourself. And it really is, you know, it really is quite quite an unreal experience when you're in a country of 25 million people, yet you've got this gorgeous piece of ocean just to yourself. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll publish some of the photos I took over the over the over the trip, I'm the trip back to uh, the Facebook group, Ocean Sailing Podcast. So if you find that on Facebook, uh, I'll publish those to the Facebook group and, and make those available there for you to check out. I also found when you're sailing solo, uh, after being used to sailing with a crew or with a family, that it's quite a it's quite an unusual experience. And it's kind of funny, but it's easy to start having a conversation with yourself, especially around tasks. Uh, you have to be really methodical. Um, if, you, if you trip yourself up by doing things in the wrong order, there's just you to sort it out. And I found it quite funny that uh, you know you, ho- you do a good hoist or a good drop, and you start telling yourself, "Hey, well done, good job, nice work," um, you know. And that's that was just four and a half days of solo sailing. So goodness knows what happens when you when you do it for two or three hundred days. So when you're sailing upwind in a in a forty five foot yacht, and in my case, I've got a twin foil on my four stay, not a furling Genoa. Um, there's a bit of work involved, and particularly when you're manually tacking a Genoa and a main and managing the helm with autopilot it's a bit of an art and, and i remember i remember that the more that i managed to tack and got my timing right that the, the the more enjoyable it got and, and so part of the strategy was the the genoa sheet that's loaded up you know you take it off the top of your winch you take a couple of turns off so you can just so you're just able to hold it with a couple of turns on the winch and this is in sort of 10 to 14 knots of breeze and then you've got the, the 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 sheet on the lazy side preloaded up, ready to trim in. And then and I had this process where I would I would I would hold both of those uh, in one hand, and then quickly tack the 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 helm over by shifting the the autopilot ninety degrees. And in the sort of ten or twelve seconds that that took to happen, then I would coil and and dump the Genoa sheet as the as the boat went through head to wind. And then quickly sheet on the lazy sheet, and, and and a couple of times I managed to nail it perfectly to the point where I got the 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 loaded sheet on the new side and hardly needed to winch at all. And I was really I was really pumped about it at the time because it just it just reinforced that so much of sailing is about is about timing rather than about brute strength. And um, there's nothing like solo sailing to teach you some of those things. And you know as I as I went north, the the wind cycled up and down, and the wind went from on the nose to to behind me, uh, the sails went up and down, and the motor went on and off uh, over the four and a half days. And, and when you're mo- hoisting a, a main and a masthead Genoa um, to the top of your mast, which is 60 foot by yourself, um, it's easy to want to minimise the hoists and drops. But thinking ahead to the solo Tasman race next year, I kind of figured that you know, if you don't hoist and drop whenever you need to, if you don't reef when you need to, if you don't do that in you know. 10 to 20 knots you're never going to figure out where all the pain points are in, in 40 or 50 knots um, and so I found it really easy to be decisive drop the sails um, and systemize that process and then and then and then not hesitate when it came to rehoisting the main rehoisting the Genoa or changing from Genoa to jib um, as the wind dictated and 
I got to the point by refining my technique, which included, you know, the full hoist of the sails included going up to the mast, hoisting the main all the way to the top by hand, tying it off on a cleat on the mast, coming back to the cockpit, pulling all the slack uh, through the jammer, leaving a little bit of little bit of uh, slack, going up to the mast, taking it off the, the cleat on the mast, coming back to the jammer, and then winching the, the, the main, the last sort of um, 12 inches to the top, then going forward, untying the genoa, which was lashed to the foredeck with some bungee cord, putting the... Um, freeing up the Genoa halyard so that it wasn't slopping around and, and uh, putting a little bit of tension on the Genoa halyard to, to pull the Genoa partway up the foil, uh, then going back to the mast, manually hoisting the Genoa all the way to the top of, 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 the, of the halyard, oh, sorry, off to the top of the, the forestay, uh, tying it off around the cleat, going to the cockpit, pulling all of the slack through the Genoa jammer, leaving a little bit, going back up to the mast, taking it off the cleat, Coming back to the cockpit, um, pulling the balance of the slack through the jammer, winching it that last little bit to the top, and and then bearing away, and putting some tension on the on the genoa sheet. I, I got to the point where I could hoist and set the main and genoa in under three minutes. A- and often when you're racing with a crew, you know depending on how you execute, it can take you you know all the three minutes to do it with a crew. So it's quite amazing. When you go solo sailing, solo sailing, or short-handed sailing, how if you really focus on your technique and the order of events, and on de-stressing the halyards and sheets, how much you can do quite efficiently. And and when you're solo sailing, you really appreciate the the value of doing everything methodically and, and in the right order. And it, it certainly gave me a new appreciation of what um, Andy Lamont's doing and in, in, in what well, did in his uh, his 300-day trip around the world. So I had a pretty successful sail north. I arrived at uh, Middle Island at the Percy's at 6 a.m. the day after uh, I left uh, the Pancake uh, after 31 hours straight uh, in terms of sailing. And uh, I felt pretty good. Uh, And it's interesting to test your body by being able to see how far you can go without becoming drowsy, which then becomes dangerous, of course, particularly when you've got traffic and land around. And... And I remember the only the only slight blimp I had was I, I was almost at Middle Island and I was coming in from the south and there's an island below Middle Island that you can either go around or you can cut through a passage between a rock and the island and the passage is easily 30 or 40 metres wide uh, and it's about 12 metres deep through the passage. And I, and I was going through the passage and it was, uh, you know, it was about 5.30 in the morning uh, and the sun hadn't quite come up. And I remember at one point thinking I'd just I'd run aground, and uh, and with it because because of it suddenly I had this big jolt um, with a boat, and and then I realised what had happened was I was standing at the wheel, I'd fallen asleep standing, and I'd fallen forward on the wheel, uh, and at the point I fell forward on the wheel, um, that translated into me thinking I was awake and actually running aground. So a uh, b- bit of a bit of a wake up call in terms of you know how how far you push it before it gets dangerous. So fortunately, I was like five minutes from the anchorage at that point, uh, and, I, and I tied up, uh, or sorry, anchored anchored at Middle Island on the southern side and, and pulled into a bay where there's maybe six or seven other boats anchored there, um, anchored in about 10 meters of water. Uh, and, and within minutes of anchoring, just as I was about to head below for a sleep for four or five hours, uh, two whales appeared right right beside me, and, and they spent... The next 45 minutes um, swimming around um, my boat and other boats on Anchorage uh, in only 10 meters of water. So it was just quite surreal. So I sat there and watched them and, and then eventually went below, slept in midday uh, and then departed about midday for Hamilton Island, um, uh, going the final sort of 90 odd miles and arriving at, at one o'clock the next morning. So um, it was a four and a half day trip that took, uh, that covered 670 nautical miles. In that four and a half days, I think I stopped three times for five or six hours of sleep, uh, and then and then I had a great great sleep when I arrived. But you know, my lessons from my first solo sail, um, you know, have food that's easy to prepare. That's so important. Um, good nutrition regularly keep, keeps your energy levels up. But make make it simple. Um, act. Don't procrastinate. You know, if you're cold, sort it out. If you're hot, sort it out. If you're thirsty, sort it out. If you need to change sales, sort it out. Don't don't 
don't wait um because often with starting it's a it's a it's a it's one thing you you procrastinate or delay doing that sets off a chain of events and when you're on your own you can't can't afford that um be methodical don't rush you know i found that the, the more methodical i was and and the more i focused on slowly doing things in the right order the the faster i got in terms of the results so that was quite interesting to see um stay hydrated don't don't use energy drinks don't live on coffee or other other things uh, by drinking six to seven liters of water every 24 hours and, and having a couple of cups of coffee i was i felt great um i really did um when you're out there and, and enjoy the wonder of it all uh it just really is special to be out on the water by yourself uh, with the sea life with the stars with with the colors you see out there with the different weather so you know enjoy the enjoy the journey as they say and you know i really encourage you to go solo sailing if you haven't tried that um it's easier than you think or you, or, and and most of your fears won't be realized and the ir- irony is the further you get away from land and other traffic the you know the simpler it is so you know it's fantastic it's great thinking time um you don't have to have furling sails and electric winches i, I don't have those things um just just treat it like sailing a big dinghy uh, and just make sure you do things things early in terms of uh, reducing sail uh, and and um it's fun to be had so i'll keep you abreast of my planned uh, race across the tasman next year um, as as it rolls around but those are my sort of thoughts and lessons on on solo sailing and again i'm going to upload more of the photos and some of the videos um, to the the ocean sailing podcast facebook group as well and then finally in this uh this section of the podcast i really wanted to uh, talk about our experience this year at Hamilton Island Race Week. Um, last year we went to Hamilton Island for the first time and entered Race Week and, and we had, the irony is we're in one of the most beautiful settings in Australia, uh, but we had one of the worst uh, racing weeks of our lives last year. And when and we you know we even recorded a podcast episode on it uh, a, a year ago. So you know, if you want to check out more detail on that, um, check out the podcast episode, which is the the crew debrief on Hamilton Island Race Week. But essentially, we um, we entered the wrong division, so we entered IRC. Uh, and as a 26 year old cruising racing type boat, uh, made of fiberglass, then then in light breeze, which is what we had, um, you're never going to be competitive against fully optimized IRC passage boats that have got carbon hulls and carbon masts and and pretty slick crews. So, um, so that that really set us back um, in terms of the results, and we also had a bad crew dynamic. We had we had a, a local expert that we we brought in to race with us for that week, and who just had a different way of doing things. Um, and as, as as intelligent as he was as a sailor, um, he just didn't fit our crew dynamic, and it really would put a downer on on crew morale, particularly uh, as as a results kind of conspired against us as well and the other thing is you know it's easy to take racing too seriously sometimes and, and last year we definitely took it too seriously um we did, didn't approach it with the right mindset and we ended up in a week where we had uh because we were in irc passage we had two races where we didn't finish in t- inside the time limit in, in light breezes uh, one by three minutes one by about 30 minutes so we had two dnfs we had one race cancelled we had a race where we went when we went around the clearing mark the wrong way we had a race we retired from with gear damage, uh, and we had one race out of six that were originally scheduled that we actually finished um, inside the time limit without being penalised, without breaking anything. So we ended up finishing 12th from uh, 12 boats, and we finished last place. And so it kind of, you know, it's quite amazing the psychology of sailing your best but coming 20 minutes behind the leader in every race uh, on corrected time or on handicap, how, how demoralising that can be, even though, you know, you're racing well. So this year, this year is all about okay, how do we enter the division that's best for us? How do we put together the the best people that are actually going to be good sailors, but you know, a great bunch of people to sail with, and and, and great to have fun with on and off the water. There's nothing more, nothing more obvious uh, than a crew that that doesn't want to spend time together off the water, or, or doesn't doesn't that can't be friends off the water in terms of in terms of crew dynamic and. If you're a racer cruiser like we are, not an out and out race team, then then you've got to get that dynamic right. Otherwise, you know, I always think it's a you're a bunch of volunteers. You're there to have fun and, and compete well, but but if you're not having fun, you know, why bother? So so this year we entered PHS. Uh, we were put in division two of of the four divisions in PHS, which are mostly cruising production type racer cruiser type boats. Um, and in our division, uh, division two, 
Um, 17 of the 25 boats in our division were kind of in the 49 to 55 foot long um, category and mostly Benetos, Bavarias, Jonos. So as a Beneto, we were in the production boat division. We were probably, um, we were shorter than, than three quarters of the fleet, we being 45 foot, but but great division. And the other thing we had, we had 10 to 20 knots on four of the race days this year. Um, we had just... Um, had our chart plotter upgraded um, after some warranty issues. And so the BNG chart plotter I used had this new feature, this new software feature called Race Start. Uh, and it's really, really cool. And I really recommend it um, if you want to have, uh, if you want to improve your race starts, it's really cool software. Uh, we used it for the first time. And in a fleet of 25 boats, we won all six of our starts. And in some cases, we were 60, 70, 80 meters ahead of the next boat. And at Hamilton Island, where you start in Dent Passage, we measured it. The, the race, the start line is actually a kilometre long. And, and the current flows through there at two to three knots at times. So what you have is such a long start line that boats hang back, in fact, a long way back um, to avoid being over because you can't see both ends of the start line because it's that long. So, so the BNG software allows you to ping both ends of the line with your chart plotter and, and essentially mark out the GPS location of the the, the starboard end and the pin end and then automatically it creates a line and it tells you automatically how many meters you are behind the line and it tells you or, or boat links depending on what you want to what data you want to see and it also tells you the favored end of the line and with an up, with a clean upwind star as we found in, on one of the days in one case when we were out on the eastern side start line where the start line was about 200 meters long um at one point, the favoured end was up to 200 metres favoured versus the other end of the line um, because of the bias with the wind. So, so in terms of software, it's really cool. Um, you can literally just look at that and say, "Cool, we're you know, we've got 10 seconds to go, and we still we still four boat lengths behind the line." And you can hit the line at pace with confidence without normally looking at what the boats either side of you are doing and worrying about whether they're over or whether they're late. Um, so that helped us immensely. And if you if you win your starts. Um, Man, you get off to yeah, get out in front quickly um, because you're not seeing all that bad air. So we won our starts. We sailed well tactically in, in five of the six races. Um, we scored a couple of thirds on handicap. Uh, we finished sixth overall. Um, and in the fourth race out of six, we were sitting in fourth position um, after you know fourth position um, in terms of fourth from the bottom mark after a really amazing kite run. Uh, and, and to put that in context. On our handicap, our boat was about the 17th fastest in terms of overall boat speed out of 25. So technically, if we finished 17th across the line, we were, you know, we were sailing to our our, our boat speed. Well, we were sitting fourth, so we, we were just we were just um, really excited. Um, however, however, uh, with 20 knots, um, we had to jibe into the bottom mark with the kite up, and, and we mismanaged the jibe, and uh, the boom slammed across uh, an extra meter or so because we hadn't managed to get the boom all the way into the center line. And, and literally the traveler exploded into two pieces. And, and now we had the main wildly flapping, um, sailing downwind with no way of um, securing it. Um, and, and fortunately, we dropped the kite at that point. Um, so we were still able to sail on the jib. So we were now reaching into the bottom mark. And, and you know, again, this is a lesson. And, in, 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 you know, if in doubt, keep sailing your boat. And, and again, in 20 knots, some boats would say, well, we've just broken our traveler. We need to withdraw from the race. But we had a you know a can-do, very very enterprising crew who had a you know no retreat, no surrender type attitude in terms of carrying on if they could. So so we're reaching into the bottom mark. Um, the mains flapping wildly. Um, we're still sailing on the jib. We're still doing seven knots just on the number three jib. And Steve, uh, one of our crew, jumped onto the jumped onto the traveler repair, got some lashings out quickly, got the boom lash back down in about 10 minutes and got, got the main working again. And so even though we lost sort of 15 to 15 places um, and, and that knocked us back to about 19th on handicap um, and, and at that point not, knocked us out of the ability to finish in the top three in, in the regatta, um, the reality is we carried on racing and uh, we finished 19th out of 25 in that race and and the team are really proud that they repaired the boat and we could carry on. And, you know, it's a much better response than the disappointment of withdrawing from a race. So, you know, it's quite amazing if you carry the right sort of spares and you have the right mindset, the things you can do to keep your boat moving. Unfortunately, our, our temporary repair meant we couldn't ease the traveler at all. Uh, and we pretty much had to lock the main down and, and uh 
and uh, sail on sail on adjusting the 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 jib or head saw for the balance of the race, and so our up and performance wasn't so great. But anyway, that's life. So so it was you know it was a it was a great week. We finished sixth on handicap out of twenty five, um, and, and we had we were we were in with in for a shot with the top three if we hadn't had that sort of breakage. So the other thing about this year was you know the I was really busy leading up to Hamilton Island and. And quite a few of the team really stepped up and, and took on a lot more of the planning role, playing an organisation for me this year. They organised accommodation, booked the golf buggy, organised breakfasts and lunches, uh, organised all the supplies, booked dinner venues, uh, made lunches each morning, filled the water bottles, um, and even organised uh, some pretty cool shirts that we wore as a team when we were out in the evening that were kind of Hawaii meets uh, Pacifica in terms of the, the colours and flavour. So, you know, the lesson for me was, you know, as, as a skipper and owner of a boat, it's easy to just take on the bulk of the planning and then sometimes not enjoy the regatta because you've got so much going on in the back of your mind. Um, it's amazing how if, you, if you've if you got a great team and you let them step up, they do, and how how much that makes a difference in terms of the overall success, success of, of, your, of your campaign or your regatta, your personal enjoyment, um, and just the ownership that they then take. And... and it's it's just you know it's a, it's a really fulfilling feeling when you have a crew that take ownership and, and and they are a you know as much of a reason for the success of the week as you are as opposed to you being chief organizer skipper bottle washer and cook etc. So you know this year versus last year my enjoyment of the week was two hundred percent greater than last year because we had fun uh, we sailed well on the water everyone played a great support role off the water uh, and we had a bunch of people that that really got on well together and. Um, you know, people from different walks of life. Two of our two of our nine crew were ringins and had never sailed together before. Um, and and but you get the right personalities and amazing. It's amazing um, how much more fun you can have as a group uh, and how how much of a culture starts to develop through throughout throughout um, you know seven or eight days together. So um, we had some you know we had some really hairy starts uh, downwind and and three of our starts were downwind starts, fifteen to twenty knots. Uh, and with kite, with boats hoisting kites before or at, at the start, and on opposite tacks. So the port end of the line, we had boats hoisting um, kites um, on um, on starboard, I mean, the, and at the starboard end of the line, we had high, boats hoisting kites um, with port poles. So we had this converging fleet. I think I've got that the right way around. We had this converging fleet where the starboard end boats were converging with the pinion boats, and, and um, one had right away and run, one didn't. And so we had some, we saw some spectacular stuff, uh, and you you literally had to start in 15 to 20 knots, and then jibe inside three to four minutes of the start before you ran into trouble on a reef. Uh, and you know it's a really good example of when you're in a passage prior to the start, and there's 200 boats sailing around waiting to start in their respective divisions. You've got to constantly think think ahead. And don't think about rights, just think about avoiding trouble. Because it doesn't matter whether you're in the right or in the wrong. If you end up on the wrong side of an incident and you end up aground, as as one particular yacht did, um, in 20 knots of breeze with your spinnaker still flying, you've, you've got big problems. And a regatta is a lot more fun if you stay out of the protest room. And so you know, we did a daily crew brief at the start of the day. Um, I always explained the course for the day, what the weather was doing, what our start tactics would be, what the sailing strategy was for the day, who had to do what when, uh, and how we were going to de-risk the start until we got clear of the fleet and clear of clear of trouble. Uh, and when you've got shallow water and rocks on, on both both ends of the start line, you, you've really got to be proactive. And you know, the thing I found was if you include the whole team, then they, they learn and understand the strategy and the bigger picture and often have some great alternative ideas. If, if you run your boat based on, hey, two or three of us at the back of the Brains Trust, as they're often called um, by media commentators, and, and just a couple of people calling all of the shots, all it kind of does, I think, is just create a bit of a class system and, and tells the rest of the team that they're, they're less important, they don't have as much to contribute. And what I found was the more the, the you teach the entire crew how you think, the more they start thinking with a bigger picture in mind, the more they can start contributing on the same level, and the more the more they bring other insights about their particular work area or, or part of the boat that that contribute to the overall picture in terms of the timing and order of their events and what they do and how that fits into the overall overall structure. So it's a really really good week of you know six days of racing, um, you know racing four to six hours a day, you know the same people every day. Debrief at the start, execution on the way, debrief at the end, and having some fun together, and, and 
you know, you can learn a lot in a short period of time um, when you've got that much racing in a con- concentrated period of time, but also when you've got big fleets where, where collision avoidance and tactics are, are really, really important. So it was a great week. And, you know, in our team for the week, every person played a key role and, and they're all able to contribute throughout the race because they were part of the plan. Uh, and we did a daily post-race debrief and we said, okay, what went well today? What can we do better? And everyone had a turn and, and contributing what their highlights were, what they thought went well, and, and what we could do better. And, and interestingly, two things came out of these sessions. Um, more often than not, it was crew members praising the performance of others. Um, that 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 was you know the primary focus, which really lifts people up when they're when they're sailing well. Um, and it means that they're more likely to support each other when the chips are down. But also the ideas that came out. Um, you know, many of which I never would have thought of at all that then drove continuous improvement and changes the next day. And in some cases, that resulted in us changing both systems, rerunning things differently, buying some bits and pieces from the channery shop. But um, as the week went on, the, the crew got better. And, you know, we started day one saying, it's blowing 20 to 25 knots. We're not going to start downwind with a spinnaker that we've got a jibe um, within three to four minutes with with essentially a crew of of, of five regulars and a couple of freshies um, and we're then not going to risk trying to reach at an apparent angle of 70 to 80 degrees um, across a three or four mile stretch of water knowing for well than 20 to 25 knots we're going to be loading the boat up rounding up risking tearing our spinnaker on the first day and and scaring the pants off some people and and so the first leg of the first race was about risk management. And, and, and the irony was it was spectacular. And we had boats with Jenikas up that, that eventually pulled ahead of us a few hundred meters. But equally, we had just as many boats rounding up, out of control, tearing spinnakers in front of us. And, and we were sailing on, uh, we, were, we were, you know, tight reaching on a main and a jib, um, doing our eight to nine knots. And, and we got to enjoy the spectacular nature of everything happening around us, out of us with, um, you know, hundreds of, well, a couple of hundred boats essentially loaded up to the max. And, and then we squared off around the, the second mark, squared off, hoisted our kite at, at an angle of about 160 degrees apparent. And uh, we hadn't taken the risk that others took and, and sailed a respectable first race. Um, so, you know, those things build confidence. And, and as the week went on, we didn't hesitate to hoist the kite in, kite in 20 knots. We didn't hesitate to jibe in 20 knots. We got more bullish about our starts and our, our ability to get out clear of trouble because we were just executing our starts really well thanks to the new software that we were using um and it really built this great momentum by the end of the regatta and and uh and you know on the last day we jumped from about 10th or 11th to 6th overall because we, we scored a third and an eighth in the two races on the last day and and it really really gave us the confidence to say well let's come back next year because you know all we've got to do really is is build on what we learned sell six good races and, and we probably top three contenders in, in, in a division that's, you know, three quarters sort of 50 to 55 foot yachts that are mostly a whole lot newer than ours. Um, and, and it just shows what poss- what's possible. So I kind of wanted just to share that sort of 15 minute kind of debrief, I guess, on my thoughts of the Audi Hamilton Island Race Week Regatta this year versus last year, given we, we created a whole podcast uh, episode last year on, on all of the things that didn't go so well. And I guess the lessons that came out of this year that I wanted to share were, you know, create a master plan for getting two and from the regatta, um, and, and everything that happens in between. And, and then if you, if you do that, then then if you ask for help and share the load and delegate and let others take ownership, um, you know, you, you end up with a better result. You've got a clear plan. They know what the plan is. They execute their part. Um, they, they, they contribute. They take ownership. And you get a better overall result because you can't do everything 100% well. And if you're so focused on doing that, then, then you might be preoccupied when you're on the water instead of helming your boat properly and, and looking after our other things. So so let, let people take ownership and, and share the load. Look for ways to have fun. Laugh a lot. Uh, let people learn from their own setbacks. They don't need you to point them out. You know, when often my experience has been with racing, when things go wrong, skip is focused on telling you over and over again what you just did wrong and what why you shouldn't have done and what you need to do next time. And the reality is, when things go wrong, people know. They, they're not silly. They, they, they know what the optimum, is, uh, optimum performance is and they know what less than good enough is and and the, the people are usually harder on themselves than you could ever be so always be supportive and let people learn from their own mistakes um let them tell you what they learned from the experience and what we need to do different differently next time um and look for the ways to have fun we we had a, a guy that joined us a friend of mine um steve tucker who flew over from new zealand for the week 
had done sailing previously, but but not sailed in the tub of sailing. We were doing with us and, and joined the crew um, cold from the get go, and sailed the entire week and 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 sailed really well. But but just was a funny guy, and and we had a lot of fun, and 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 a lot of the comedy and and humour created out of challenging or, or difficult situations just really helped to keep the momentum and keep the keep crew morale great and and remind people that we're there to have fun and and you know steve would occasionally yell out you know um you know an expletive word followed by you know this is just amazing um just the, the sheer exhilaration of being a hamilton Island with 200 boats and in, in the environment with the weather and the sun and the islands and the whales and everything else just reminded us all we were just having a great time and that you know not to take sailing too seriously create a theme with your team um alex and helen two of our crew bought some um, shirts that would have almost won a poor taste competition but not uh, for 14 dollars um in hawaii when they're on holiday um or vegas one or the other i can't remember i think it was vegas and uh we wore those button-up shirts at night as a crew whenever we went out and it was quite a funny the people that came up to us in the street and commented on our our, our fantastic crew uniform and on our on our sh- on our shirts and how good we looked as a group and they were pretty cool shirts and again i'll post some photos in the in the facebook group um but but it just reminds us you know if you're a great team on the water and you're a great team off the water um that you you build a really special bond that that gets you through all sorts of things thick and thin um when you're off the water you know don't just head to dinner and head home to your room um, do some great R and R stuff together. Um, that's also important as well. One of our crew said one night, "Why don't we, why don't we drive to the top of the island um, and, and have fish and chips, at, fish, fish and chips and champagne at sunset?" And logistically, that meant getting people from the boat, from hotels, getting people to the fish and chip shop, getting people to the bottle shop, and, and then somehow getting you know, I don't know, ten of us up to the top of the island, um, right on sunset with hot fish and chips and and wine and, and, and plastic cups and it all kind of came together and uh we did that and we had fish and chips and, and we literally started them as three or four minutes before the sun went down and, and it was just a magic experience and it was really simple but um it was great it was just a great experience and it was a highlight of the week for for some of the team um so do do some great stuff off the water together when you're at regatta especially if you're traveling to some of these amazing places around the country around the world um don't make it all about the racing and then lastly, work work on making sure your team members get along. Um, and this is some lessons from last year. Don't don't let niggles creep in or problems go unresolved. And then as a skipper or your team leader or boat owner, it's kind of your stuff to tackle that stuff head on and not let it fester. So if you have any niggly stuff that you've seen happen on the water, uh, if you if you see any stuff that, that that's not in good humor and actually is just sarcasm or, or or you know quite pointed, then make sure that you take people aside, check that they're okay. Make sure you resolve issues. Make sure you work out how to avoid whatever happened happening again. And don't let stuff fester because it's quite amazing by the end of the week if you let stuff fester, particularly between a couple of crew members or between a crew member and others, how, how morale starts to drop, people start to get frustrated, um, things start becoming unenjoyable and, and, and the fun goes out of it. So we didn't, we didn't have any of that stuff um, this year. Um, we had a couple of, couple of times we had to check things were okay um, where sometimes jokes go a little bit too far, but all in all, you know, if, if your if your team members get along with each other and, and they're there in good humour, and you don't let, let niggles or issues creep in, uh, or, or, or disputes go unresolved, um, we had, for example, actually this is a good one. We had a crew member, Jeff, who flew up from um, uh, Sydney uh, to sail with us. Um, well, I think Central Coast, New South Wales, to sail with us. Um, friend of Alan's who, who raced with us, um, and, and on one particular day. Uh, he came down to the boat with a bunch of bananas that he was bringing aboard uh, to take out for lunch, and you know, he was happy to share them with others. And, and then a couple of our crew said, "Well, what the hell do you think you're doing? You can't, you can't, ta- you can't take bananas on a boat. Um, you know, it's just you can't." And and Jeff, you know, Jeff thought they were kidding, and they were quite serious, and and it almost got a bit tense. And Jeff said, "Well, I'm not taking the bananas off the boat." And they said, "Well, you have to." And Jeff went off to the bathroom and. Somebody said, well, if Jeff doesn't take the bananas off the boat, I'm going to go into his cabin and take them off. Um, and, you know, it's one of those situations where good humor can become, become a, you know, it can escalate into a problem between people. And, and we had to make sure that that stayed as humorous as it was, that the, they were stored safely in the golf buggy for the day so the bananas were still available. Uh, and that, you know, we, we explained to Jeff later that, you know, it was a long, deep-seated superstition among some sailors. And rightly or wrongly, it was what it was. But, you know, it, it wasn't anything personal, and um, it was simple, but 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 it quite it quite quickly became tense 
for a, for a moment there. Um, but we, we resolved and, and carried on. And um, and I chatted to Jeff a couple of times just to check he was okay. So, you know, those kind of things are really important. So I guess that's my summary of what I've been doing um, and what I wanted to share with you. And, um, you know, as I look ahead now, I've just caught up with Andy Lamont for two and a half hours uh, yesterday. And that episode will be out in the next uh, couple of weeks or so. Um, I've got a chat scheduled with Rob Mundell, who uh, wrote the book on uh, Jimmy Spittle uh, and his uh, his quest to win multiple America's Cups. Um, and so I'll tell you all about that uh, when, I, when I talk to Rob next week and find out some insights about Jimmy and his background in his early years. Um, it's been a great year. Um, New Zealand holds the America's Cup. That's always pretty, pretty exciting for me as a New Zealand uh, America's Cup supporter. Um, I'm planning for my first Sydney to Hobart race. Uh, in 10, 12 weeks' time. Uh, I'll keep you abreast of that. And, and I'm planning for a solo Tasman race next year, which is something I want to do. So again, I'll look to share some of the lessons that I learn um, in the lead-up uh, and along the way with that. So folks, thanks for joining me this week on the Ocean Sailing Podcast. Um, hopefully some of my personal experiences help you with some of your planning and some of your thoughts, particularly if you're a cruising racing sailor or, or somebody who just wants to cruise. Um, and I'll look forward to catching you in the next episode. Thanks, folks, and uh, happy sailing. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. Email your comments and suggestions to david at oceansailingpodcast.com.au. See you next week. Thanks for joining me this week on the Ocean Sailing Podcast. I publish the Ocean Sailing Podcast to share interesting stories about ordinary people doing extraordinary things from a sailing point of view, whether that's uh, racing locally, coastal cruising, or, or sailing around the world. So if you've got a great story, or you've got something you'd like to share, or you know of somebody I can interview, please email me, david, at oceansailingpodcast.com.au. Uh, if you'd like to be a host interviewer on the show, grab your uh, mobile phone uh, and tackle somebody you've met or that you know. Sit down, and, and if you can record an audio file, uh, and send it to me. Maybe I can publish your episode as an episode on the Ocean Sailing Podcast. We have listeners now in more than 100 countries around the world. And I really would like to gather a, a, a broader range of stories from people of all sorts of nationalities and backgrounds. So if you want to do something like that, feel free to drop me a line. I'm happy to help you prepare, give you some advice, uh, or just simply write down six to ten questions that you'd like to ask that person and before you know it, you will have filled up an hour having an interesting conversation. So if you record that with a mobile device, create an audio file, send that to me, then that's usually enough for me to be able to, to, be able to publish that. Uh, try to block, block out background noise, chatter, uh, try to avoid windy situations and that type of thing. And pretty much I can work with that. So if you'd like to help me publish an episode uh, by being a guest host on the show, Feel free to try your hand at having an interesting conversation with somebody interesting that's doing something in the world of sailing. Folks, thank you, and I'll catch you at the next episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. And by the way, remember to check out oceansailingpodcast.com with links to various websites and show notes of all of these people that I'm talking to about all these interesting things that they do. Thank you, and see you next time. I painted a picture of the I picture cold, dark sand and skies I painted the future how it's supposed to be With warm sun in a bright town So turn around and hear them speak So turn around and help them out Turn around cause you're watching them Watching some getting ready to die